There you go. There you go. Okay. Thank you guys. I hope that everybody had a wonderful lunch break. I appreciate your attentiveness as we power through these afternoon modules. I've distributed some candy on your tables just to help incentivize the afternoon and um, hopefully you know, we'll just get through this. If anybody has any questions, please remember it's totally fine to ask those questions. Um, as you remember, we finished off with proxy outcomes and now we're starting off with module number four and module number four is on page 49. So I do want to just recap kind of where we've been so we understand where we're headed. Um, again, that planning process is pretty critical, but we started off with uh, assessment and then we went to planning and that was using the mission statement and assessment data to identify results. And so now we're going to be going into implementation um, and that's services and strategies that produce results. So module number four is called implementing the plan. Um, could somebody please read those learning objectives? Participants will understand the importance <laughs> of phrasing the plan prior to implementation. Participants will be introduced to Reginald Carter. Tarter, sorry and the seven key questions used to support planning and management. Participants will be able to identify outcome indicators. Participants practice creating outcome indicators for identified needs, outcomes, and strategies. Participants are introduced to the standard set of performance indicators established for all CA8. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So, Really, right now, what we're doing within this aroma cycle is we're getting to the implementation period. This implementation period is when we operationalize our plan. And so that's what we're going to do is use our plan as a guide for implementation as well as to reporting. Um, if you turn the page to page number 50, we'll start off there. And uh, I want to know how many of you have access to our agency's strategic plan? Um, I don't know. No, I don't. I'm sure. I did at one point. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'm going to say you actually all have access to it. So we have that um, on our website. We have that out oh, yeah. in the lobby. And so we do have access to those resources. It's there for our review. And it's helpful because it's <laughs> Thing that our executive director and our board makes us go back and answer to quite often and so this is uh, just a really good tool for us um, so again we have to think about how our agency uses the plan and so I've just provided you with some background of how community action uses the plan and it has been really that tool that we use to guide the implementation of the programs that we offer is referencing back to that. Um, and it also helps us with guiding the collection and analysis of data. So what happens is, well, you know, from the executive director's office, the management team gets emails where we have to report out on our progress towards the goals that have been identified within the strategic plan so that we make sure that we're on track, so that we're not just reporting when we have to, but we're reporting that incremental change um, as time passes, so that we're able to update and make sure that our plan is being implemented effectively, and so that we can regroup and you know put our strategies in a different direction if we need to. So um, Drucker tells us that a well-written plan will help us get the right things done. He also reminded us of the importance of the involvement of the agency's board of directors, which you know we have the tripartite board, and so this board is what really governs what we do, and we report back to them quite often. Uh, and so we are now gonna be introduced to Drucker question number five, okay? And so Drucker question number five is what is our plan? Okay, so, can somebody please read that paragraph number two that starts with the self-assessment process on page 50? Sure. The self-assessment process leads to a plan that is a concise summation of the organization's purpose and future direction. The development and formal adoption of mission and goals are fundamental to effective governance of a nonprofit organization and are our primary responsibilities of the board. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the strategic elements of the plan must be approved by the board. Yes, absolutely. So in that IM 49, and again, 
that's something that gave us kind of that governance document on what we needed to do and articulated what needed to happen. It talks a lot about the responsibility of the board as well as the entity because the board needs to be the one that helps us determine you know, when the plan is gonna be set in motion and we need to be responsible and accountable to our board of directors as well as to the national network. So um, a plan isn't necessarily about just having <coughs> these strategies and outcomes fixed, but it's more about proving our ability to continuously refer back to the plan as we move forward. So we're always gonna be referencing that. Again, like I said, as our agency does, we incorporate that into making sure that we're on target so that we don't go too astray or go down a path where we're not achieving the outcomes that we wanna have. So having that as a process is a really important thing. So we, um, we review and appraise the value of each element of the plan and we update it as data is collected. <coughs> so it may be that we need to make some adjustments because maybe some of our original um, predictions or anticipated results were off target for whatever reason, but as we're collecting data and we're reviewing that plan, we see that it would be more um, efficient for our agency in terms of internal capacity and realistic expectations of the people that we serve to alter our plan in a way that uh, reflects kind of what the data is supporting. So um, we also just have to be real flexible with it because there are changes within our community and so sometimes those environmental changes impact what the plan is. If we made the plan and there wasn't another agency providing a service and now there is one, we're going to adjust our plan because we're not going to continue to kind of chase down something that's already being met in other areas. Okay. So um, again, that I am 49 says that strategies, uh, we have to, that the plan should account for strategies that use existing resources and develop new ones to address needs of the relationships and act, um, activities supported by the agency to other anti-poverty community development services in the community and the extent um, it also defines just the extent that the agency activities contribute to the accomplishment of one of more of those national goals. So that's what IM49 wants, is they want to see that you know, we have a strategic plan, it's something that's in place, it's reinforced, you know, reinforces some of these historic goals. Okay? So with this, we have to remember that nonprofit organizations are information driven. <coughs> or data driven and so that's the you know that's how we get our plan is by analyzing that data um, and what we measure and how we measured it is really what we're saying we think is relevant you know we have those national performance indicators they give us some of that governance but really what we're doing in-house to measure our outcomes within our plan is really a critical piece so um, what we see here is that uh, with implementing the plan on page 51, you guys want to move over to that, we see that a well-written plan leads to sound management and accountability provided that it's, or a well-written plan leads to sound management and accountability as long as it's implemented right. So all it is is a piece of paper if we don't actually implement the steps that are there. And that's what happens often is that agencies will develop a strategic plan and that just satisfies some sort of a requirement, but they won't necessarily implement the plan in a way that really gets and produces the outcomes that we want. So we need to make sure that because we are you know, accountability focused, that we're implementing things in a sound way. So work doesn't get done with the magnificent statement of need or of policy. Work is done when it's done. Done by people, um, done by people who are properly informed, assigned, and equipped. So we have to make sure that everybody in our process knows about it. We have to make sure that everybody in our process knows the tools that we need in order to accomplish our plans and to meet those outcomes. And we have to make sure that everybody has been assigned with a specific task within that process because we are a team that will work together in order to achieve the desired outcome. So again, we are information based and so we have this board that helps you know with the communication to management so we report to the board um, department directors do a, a, a board report where they have to summarize at each board meeting what's going on within the department progress made towards specific identified goals 
And then it's also the responsibility of the board to make sure that they're communicating with us so that we know what the board needs. It needs to be just that volley of information. We're telling them what's going on. They're telling us if they have ideas or think that there needs to be a resharpening of focus on some identified goals. So those are really critical pieces that we have there. Um, we also want to make sure that, again, we identify what we measure and how we measure it to determine exactly what's going to be considered relevant. Okay? So does somebody want to read on page 51, it starts with the agency's strategic plan. Guides the implementation of your strategies to achieve results, but before you can implement your plan, you must understand the elements which must be operationalized for quality service delivery. These include, you want me to read this? Yeah, yes please. Identifying the fundamental elements necessary for implementation and identifying procedures and personnel for observation and reporting of results. Hmm. Okay. And so this helps us, again, with just identifying what it is that's going to be important in the implementation process. So um, we have to be accountable, and we have to be accountable with implementing a plan that produces the outcomes. And so one question that we're asked um, quite often is, how many people as, have we as a network moved out of poverty? <laughs> wow. wow. It's really hard to answer. Yeah. You know, and, and For we, how long? as a network, have been yeah. criticized as a result of that because we can't articulate that. We can't right. articulate that's, it for a number of yeah, reasons. That's a pretty vague question. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, one of the reasons it's hard is because um, there's not really a standard definition of what out of poverty is That's and what, what you hit on there. Like, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Yeah. And then we, as a CSBG agency, we were supposed to target our services for people under 125% of the poverty level. Well, everyone in this room knows that even if you're at 130% of the poverty level, it doesn't mean necessarily that you've moved out of poverty. So, mm -hmm. it's a really difficult thing for us to be able to do because we have a hard time articulating exactly what that looks like and what that needs or means, okay? So we're gonna be using that idea or that concept as kind of the introduction to the accountability piece of the Roma cycle um, and the discussions that are found in the remaining modules. So remember we talked about how with Drucker, he was the guy that was going to bring that management framework to us. Um, we're going to start talking about Reginald Carter, and he's the guy that brings the age aroma. So he <laughs> gives us, yeah, it's, it's the accountability piece, you know, and that's what he talks about is how do we become accountable because we have to be able to answer certain questions, you know, based upon the needs we identified, our services and strategies, our desired outcomes, and the plans that we've developed. And so we're going to start talking about Reginald Carter on page number 52. And he has a lot of experience. Um, he produced or published this book called The Accountable Agency, and it is available for download if anybody is interested in just you know, seeing exactly what that means. Um, he did this in 1983, so it was ahead wow. of that identification of us having to be mandated, re, you know, mandating that we report our outcomes. And so um, what he says is, you know, it extends the framework to those accountability questions or answers. And so it was published in 1983, and, um, and in 2006 they went ahead and put it onto the, the network's website. And so you can get onto, there's actually the link down below there if you just want to refer to it. Um, again, it's pretty valuable just because it helps kind of frame in some of these concepts that we go over rather quickly in this introduction course. Uh, when he did develop these seven questions, can people see this? Is this an awkward spot? I'd be happy no, to move Travis it if it would be. They're right in front okay, of and us, too. And you have that in your book. So yeah. just now use those references. Um, we've got some awkward, yeah. Look at Travis. Come on, he's, Travis. he's getting big. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, these were developed in 1983, but they're wow. just as relevant today as they were then because it's really about agency, the core agency um, accountability and program pieces. So. He worked then in consultation with the folks that did this whole Roma development to make sure that this was woven in in a way that made sense, and, um, and he was supportive in that process. So 
On page number 52, as we said, uh, we will see that he lists off all seven of the questions, or um, the, the manual introduces all seven of the questions. We work on one, two, three, and six, okay? That's what we're gonna work on right now. The remaining questions really about the fiscal accountability piece and some of those financing pieces. And so that's just not something that we're gonna address at this point, but um, can have a later discussion about. So uh, they get into the cost factor of it. You know, what is the cost factor? What is the bottom line with that? So uh, these frame criteria for accountability that look at efficiency as well as effectiveness because um, we need to make sure that we're hitting both of those marks. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so let's move on to page number 53 where we get to jump into the first question that's presented by Carter. Um, can somebody please read question number one and the two bullets that follow? <coughs> How many clients are you serving? The number of individuals projected to be served is often based on budget and other resource data. This projected number is important as you implement your plan. Agencies must be able to provide unduplicated counts of their clients being served. Without this ability, clients may be counted multiple times. Okay. Does our agency do that? We've never had that problem. Unduplicated counts? I'll bet we do. Okay. I, I would say that this is something that we continue to have to have a great level of awareness about. We have a number of different programs. Our mm -hmm. programs become siloed with individual databases where we enter mm -hmm. information. Because some of those databases don't have conversations, we can't cross-reference if one person has actually been counted into three different programs. And we, we as an agency put it into action. everybody we see. We are working on that, and we are so happy to have an IT guru on board to be able to cultivate one that works well for us. So we'll talk yes, more we'll about that, that later on. Yeah. So <laughs> we're moving in that direction and using databases that are the most common throughout the programs in which we operate. So now we're implementing mm. the use of CDS in programs that hadn't been there before, and it's because we have a unique identifier associated with household serves then. So then we're able to say for sure this is unduplicated mm. because this unique identifier is going to be for you as you receive services through LIAP, through weatherization, as well as through some housing programs. So Which we're working on trying to come up with a way to have that consistent, you know, that unduplicated count. But it's something we constantly wow. need to be aware of. You know, it's super critical because we don't want to provide some artificial results. We don't want to count somebody four times. You know, that's not the consistency that we need. So is there something that's available right now? Right now that could be that is being used for that or is that the we at some point we'll talk because we do have e-logic we're going to talk more about that okay. as we continue moving forward it's woven into this particular curriculum okay. and we'll talk some about that it becomes then a capacity thing too of entering data you know so it's just something that we're keenly aware of and that we're working pretty aggressively towards addressing, but it's something that just constantly needs to be on our radar is making sure that we don't have duplicated counts because that's gonna inflate our results in a way that we don't want. We want for these to be accurate. We want for them to be consistent. Mm -hmm. So um, okay. we have to make sure, again, we wanna have something that has a consistent identifier uh, and the other thing that we have to look at too is when a client becomes a client. So mm -hmm. for instance, I'm gonna draw off of you know our emergency housing services, that's what I did for a long time, and we are mandated to report once a client receives some type of financial assistance to obtain housing. However, every application that we received, we interacted with that individual on some level. That could be referrals, that could be helping them self-navigate through a situation that's sticky with a landlord. So when does that person become a client? We're mandated to report it once they get that that assistance, but do we report it then once they have that direct interaction with case management? So we as an agency mm. within our departments have to make sure that we have a consistent definition of when somebody becomes a client mm -hmm. because otherwise that gets, a, we're either gonna undercount the number of people that we interact with, like we have 400 applications in a year, but we only provide direct assistance to 20% of those people. So, you know, we're reporting out on 20% when 80% of them wound up getting something from us which was you know attention time. yeah exactly which time is mm -hmm. money so mm -hmm. we have to make sure we're consistent with the way that we report so that's Carter's first question that's there wow. is making sure that we have that 
Um, so the second question is going to be, it's key to collect, uh, who are they? So we just have to make sure that we're collecting the demographic information that's going to be able to help us paint a picture of those we serve. So in this process, um, we like the idea of a relational database as something that we're right. able to specifically identify, you know what, we're going to look in here and I'm going to be able to tell you how many 18 to 35 year old Hispanic females with less than two children are receiving welfare benefits.